Welcome to Lake Sawyer Church. We are a church in the heart of our community with a heart for our community. A church that longs to help people find and follow Jesus. A church that is for all people, people in varying stages of their spiritual journey, people who are hurting and broken, people who need hope, people of all races and backgrounds, people who are young and people who are old. We are for the single parent, the empty nesters, those with kids and those without. We are a church that invests in our kids and our students. We believe that they aren't just the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. We make room for all people because we have seen time and time again how Jesus changes everything for everyone. Hey, good morning. Good to see you. Why don't you all stand up? We're going to do some singing this morning. Sing it loud. We have something to celebrate. Come on.
where there is war, let fighting cease. All that divides us, come reconcile us. Make me a vessel of your peace. Make me a vessel of your Where there is hatred, break it up. All creeds and colors bind us together. Make me a vessel of your love and pour me out. Pour Cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His body bound and 
drenched in tears They laid him down From Joseph's tomb The entrance sealed By heavy stone Messiah still And all alone Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God Who oh, praise His name forevermore For endless days we will sing Your praise Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God And break of dawn of the Son of Heaven rolls again. Who oh, trampled death? Where is your sting? The angels roar. Oh, Christ the King. of white the blazing sun shall peace the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on Jesus Listen, as a husband and a father, I just want to challenge the men in the room that we are to lead as best we can. And if I'm honest, I'm only seeing hands up in the air that belong to women. And though we need strong women of God, we need strong men of God that we need to celebrate today as much as we're going to do at a football game or a baseball game, we can celebrate today. You hear me? Let's sing. Within this praise, we will see your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Come on, fellas, let me hear you. Joyful noise for he is king. Come on. Good morning, everyone. You can have a seat. My name is Tracy. I'm the student ministries pastor here. We're going to take a minute. We're going to pause and participate in something called communion. We do this every Sunday. It's a way that we stop and we remember the sacrifice of Jesus. And we do that with some bread and with some juice. The bread represents Jesus' body and the juice, his blood. Scripture tells us that, his, that he was pierced for our transgressions and that it's that punishment 
that brings us peace. Also, that it's by his wounds that we've been healed, that this sacrifice that Jesus made, it's for you and it's for me. Now, the good news is that this is a sacrifice that was once for all time. And so even though I will fall short again and again and again, and all of us will make mistakes again and again, Jesus has already paid it all. He has already made the sacrifice. But what we do is we take communion again and again and again, and we recenter ourselves on who Jesus is, on what he has done for us, on the good news of the grace and the life that only he can give. And so we're going to take communion this morning. If you are here for the first time or you're new to church or not sure where you're at with Jesus, there's no pressure to take communion this morning. This for you can be a a time on your own, just a quiet moment maybe to reflect. If on your way in, you did not grab your communion, you don't have to go and get it. We have ushers who would love to bring it to you. Just stay right where you're at. Raise your hand and they will bring it to you. Let's take a moment and consider and remember what Jesus did. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the way that you love us. Thank you for Jesus. You loved us in that way that you sent your son Jesus to die in our place. And and we received that this morning. Help us to recenter who we are on that good news that everything else flows from that. Our need was great and yet your love was greater. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here at Lake Story Church for the first time, we want to say welcome. Thank you for being here. We would love a chance to meet you and, and say hello. And so we have a little place called Guest Central. They're at both of these corners of the room. We would love for you to come and say hello. Also, Guest Central is where you get one of these bad boys. It is a welcome packet, just a way for you to get to know all the ways to get connected here. And if you are new and tuning in online, you can go to our website and click I'm New. This one is for the men. Men, we are starting a four-week study. It starts this week on Thursday, and we'll be exploring what it looks like to win in all the areas of life that matter most. Again, this starts on Thursdays, and it's this week, this Thursday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Uh, This study is going to be led by our lead pastor, Mike Ferruli, and it's going to be really great. If you would like more information or if you would like to register, you can go to the link on the screen. And groups like this, and everything we do here at Lake Sewer, it's all because of your generosity. It's only because of your giving that we are able to do what we do and help people find and follow Jesus. And so if you're someone who's partnered with us through giving, thank you for your generosity. If you have not partnered with us, we've made it really easy for you to make that step when you are ready. And so you can give easily online. We also have some drop boxes at each of the exits on your way out. This morning, we are wrapping up our series called Indivisible. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you.
Good morning. How's everybody doing today? And as Tracy mentioned, we're wrapping up our series, Indivisible, today. And before we do that, I just want to take a quick second to address something I said last week. Last week, uh, I made a comment about Governor Inslee. And in the process, I actually did what I said I wasn't going to do uh, throughout this series. I was controversial. And some of you reached out, some of you challenged me on that, and honestly, I'm grateful for the challenge. I'm also grateful for the ways uh, that you've allowed me to challenge you throughout this series. Probably won't come as a surprise to you, but I have gotten more feedback on this series than any series I have ever done here at Lake Sawyer Church. Uh, Matter of fact, I've gotten more feedback on this series than all of the other series I've ever done combined. Um, Overwhelmingly, though, what that feedback has been is it's been gratitude. Uh, Not so much uh, for the things I'm saying and what it means to someone else, but people have been grateful for the ways that I have challenged, I have stretched. I've encouraged us to maybe look at this season and to look at the world a little bit different. I mean, the whole heart behind the series, and I said this was in week one, was one, how do we live out our calling as ambassadors of Christ? First and foremost, that we are ambassadors of our King Jesus. The second thing I said is, could we be the kind of people who place our faith filters ahead of our political filters? And overwhelmingly, as a church, we have done this Well, And I want to applaud us as a church for holding the tension. We haven't agreed on everything, but we haven't allowed division to become the end results of our disagreement. Uh, Pastor Andy Stanley, who's a pastor in the Atlanta area, he would say this. He would say, disagreements are inevitable, but division is a choice. And I absolutely love that. I love the way he says that disagreements are inevitable. We're going to disagree about things. As people, we disagree about all sorts of things, but division is actually a choice. And I think it's part of the reality is in the world we live in today, we believe that division in many ways is the only option. Yet there's a part of us that knows that there, are, there, there is a different solution, there is a different reality. Because we remember, when we were younger, it seems like people could disagree but not divide. Now, t- tell me if this doesn't ring a bell of a bygone era. I, I grew up in a fairly large family. My dad had uh, three brothers and a sister, and so uh, whenever we'd get together for the holidays, there was a lot of aunts and uncles, there was a lot of cousins, and it was an enjoyable time for us as a family. When we'd get together, we would sit at two tables. There'd be the adults' table and the kids' table. How many of you guys remember kids' tables? Yes, I love the kids' table because in the kids' table, under every plate was a $20 bill. Like, it was amazing. Yeah, I know, it's pretty cool. So if I come over your house and if I'm looking underneath the plate, it's just, it's habit. So we'd have the kids' table and the adults' table. And I love the kids' table because we got paid to sit there. But I also love the kids' table because, well, we were close enough to the adults' table to hear what the adults got to talk about. And so often, uh, my uncles, my grandparents, they would talk about politics. And they, again, they had different experiences, different views on the world. And so sitting around that table would be Republicans and Democrats. And they would talk about ideas. They would talk about what they see as the problems in the world. They would talk about the solutions that they saw in the world. And, and, and we're, we're, we're Italian, so we would like debate it or they would debate it vehemently and like the, the volume level of the conversation w- w- would rise and they would go back and forth, back and forth, very rarely ever landing on agreed upon solution. Yet when dinner was over, every single holiday, we would do the same thing. We would get up from the table, we would pick up our plates, we would go to the kitchen, and then someone in the family, mostly my uncles, would start washing dishes. And when they wash dishes, it's like the conversation just moved on. Like we started laughing and talking about something entirely different. Like it's like what? we were talking about or what they were talking about over dinner wasn't something that would define the relationship. What mattered for our family and what mattered for so many families was a sense of belonging, that we belonged together, that we felt like together we were stronger. And so things that that were like insignificant, and I know that's a hard thing to say when it comes to politics, but things that my family viewed as insignificant, they weren't going to allow those things to divide us. 
And so we chose the belonging that we had in a, as a family and placed that above some of the differences that we have in our world. But over the years, my family, it's changed. And a lot of that happens because as people today, we are more mobile than ever. Like some of my, my, my uncles, they picked up and moved. Some of my cousins, they picked up and moved to different cities and different states. And, and as that happened, our family, some of the belonging that we had together began to dissipate because we were separated. And by nature, all of us want to have people that we find ourselves like comfortable with. And so as people land in new locations, they try to replicate belonging in something else or someone else. They look to churches. Can we belong to a church? They look to hobbies. Is, is there a place where I belong? They even look to politics. They look to people who see the world like them, who view the world like them, who share some of the same concerns that they have. Have some of the same values that they have, who want the same thing that they want. And here's what happens. And it's just part of just our broken, sinful nature. But when we begin to form as people, when we begin to huddle up, when we find our belonging in a group of people, we can, we can start looking at our people and then form biases of other people. It's not something we like do intentionally, but it's like these people look like us. They think like us. They value what we value. And then there's the other group of people. And so we start to form a bias on those people. Now, again, I don't want to be controversial. And so I really, really hope that this is not a controversial statement. Let's just talk about Russell Wilson for a second. For nine years, Russell Wilson was the quarterback of the Seattle Seahawks. For, in the course of that nine years, he helped lead the Seahawks to two Super Bowls, won the first Super Bowl in the franchise history, and to this day holds numerous records, franchise records. And when he was here, when he belonged to us, when he was a part of our city, people loved, well, well, it's so funny, this shows how, like, how little I think about the Seahawks, I have to fight saying Russell Westbrook, who's a Laker. I almost said Russell Westbrook right there. Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson. So, like, we, like, he leaves. He's no longer a part of this city. Once he was traded, once he wanted out, everything changed for him. The city turned on him. And part of what's happening there is a, a psychological principle that is known as the fundamental attribution error. And I've talked about this before, but in essence, this is what's happening. When we look at other people, when we look at other people, people who, not, who are not like us, people who don't belong in our group, when we look at other people, we attribute their behavior to their character. At the same time, when we see some of those same attributes playing out in our life or among our group of people, we apply a different bias to that behavior. So again, outside people, we, we see what they're doing and we attribute what they're doing to their character. When it's our group of people, we just uh, apply a, a much more simplistic bias to it. We sort of pass things off. It's not a big deal. So this is how it plays out when it comes to Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson's the quarterback of the Seahawks. And when he's the quarterback of the Seahawks, I have heard people talk about his greatness. Man, what he's able to accomplish on the field, he's impossible to sack. He is incredible. And not only is he incredible, but he is confident. Like you can just tell out there, he has like a swagger about him. He's confident when he's on the field. And the way he uses his popularity, the way that he uses his platform to talk about the things that he values, like the city, he loves the city of Seattle, the way that he talks about his faith, we applaud it. We think these are just, this is, Russell Wilson is great. And then he gets traded. And then he gets traded, and now he's in Denver, and we're like, you know what? He's washed up. Well, I thought he was great. No, no, he's washed up. And, 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 and he's arrogant. Well, I thought it was confidence. No, 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 he's arrogant. And, and the way he uses his popularity and the way he uses his platform, it's entirely self-seeking. All he cares about is himself. Like he's the same dude. He just belongs somewhere else now. 
And because he belongs somewhere else, because he belongs with someone else, it has changed the way that we see him. And when we do this, it starts to get us in this mindset where we start again. We label people, we categorize people, we put people in different camps. We have our people, and then there's everyone else. There's our people, and then we have stereotypes for the other groups of people. And again, everybody does this. Everybody does this. We see, we see it in just every part of our life, but we also see it in politics. Matter of fact, the Pew Research Group recently did a study, and this is what they wanted to know. What stereotypes does one party have of the other party? And this is what they found. So they surveyed Republicans, they surveyed Democrats, and here's some of that research. Republicans said Democrats were lazy and immoral. That's who they were. Democrats said Republicans were closed-minded and unintelligent. Now, they did agree on something. Both groups of people said the other was dishonest. So there's common ground here. (laughs) And what is happening here is they're seeing someone else. They're seeing attributes at play. And they're defining those actions as a reflection of a person's character. At the same time, when some of those same attributes are playing out in their group, they're quick to pass it off. It's also what's known as the desirability bias. And the University of London did a research study in this, and particularly, what role does uh, desirability bias play in the realm of politics? And just so we all understand, this is basically what desirability desirability bias looks like. It's that when someone or a group of people receive desirable evidence which reinforces what they believe, they took note of that information, incorporated it into their belief. So again, there's this group of people, just define any group of people. When they receive some sort of outside information that affirms what they believe, they take note of it and they incorporate it into their belief system. Now, on the other hand, when they receive less than desirable information, when they receive something that doesn't reinforce their belief, they reject it, they wrote it off, they didn't allow it to change what they believe. So again, we take both these things and we can see what's happening in our world today. One, we have the fundamental attribution error. So what we see in other people, it's because of their character, because they're bad people, because they're, they're, they're just unintelligent. They're lazy, fill in the blank, whatever it is. But we don't apply that same bias to ourselves. On the other hand, any information that we receive that reinforces what it is we believe, we take that in. Anything that doesn't, we push that aside. And what's happening is it's only leading to us further entrenching ourselves into sort of an us versus them mentality. Like there's my camp and there's their camp. My team and that team, and because we all have blind spots. I mean, we all do. We all, we all have blind spots in our life. We start to think, well, my team is the good team, and the other team is the bad team, and we choose division. We choose division. Disagreements, they're inevitable. Division is a choice. We choose division because, frankly, it's just easier. Like, it's just easier. It's just easy to look at and go, okay, well, like, I, all my people think what I think. I don't even want to deal with those people, so we just divide. It's easier than stepping into some of the chaos, some of the mess, some of the difficulty of bringing a lot of different ideas together. But none of this is the way of Jesus. Jesus nowhere in the scriptures calls his people to divide. What we do see, though, is that Jesus understood the temptation that we would have as people to divide. The way that we would have to, desire we'd have to pursue the things that we care about with the people that we care about. And that's why Jesus spent time again and again and again reminding his followers of the main thing. Reminding them of the most important thing instead of getting caught up in the swift winds of the wrong thing. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 in verse 33. Jesus says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus says, seek first God. Principally, seek God 
primarily seek the things of God, live out his teachings. That's what right, righteousness is. It's living a life that is right in the eyes of God. Seek after God's things. Pursue his kingdom. Live out his teachings. Focus your eyes on the things of Jesus. And as you focus your eyes on the things of Jesus, eventually your eyes will begin to see people the way that Jesus sees people, which is so tough. Because let's be honest, that's not how most of us walk through life. Like we don't look at someone and think of, we don't look at someone and see them as like for all they could be. We, we don't look at people and see them as Jesus sees them. We have a tough time separating who a person is from what they believe. Who a person is from some of the things that they pursue. And I know that in that moment it's like, well, of course we can't separate these things. We absolutely can't separate these things because these things, what they believe, it is wrong. It is morally wrong, it is biblically wrong, it is sin. And Jesus himself, he would not separate sin. He would not overlook the things we do from the person we are. But allow me just to take a second to remind us of what Paul said. Paul said these words in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. He said, but God demonstrates his love for, his own love for us in this. That while we were still what? Sinners. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, Jesus himself, he didn't say, well, I mean, if, if this is what you believe or this is the actions that you have, well, then I didn't come for you. He says, look, I, I see you for who you are. I see you for who I made you to be. I know the good that is in you. And he surrendered his life even while we were still sinners because he loved us. Yet we continually try to justify our position of, on other people, even people within the church, under the veil moral or under the veil of moral high ground. Like we, 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 try, we pretend like we're taking the moral high ground. Like, well, this, this, is, this is wrong. It's against what God says. And when that happens, what we're doing is we're arbitrarily making judgments about who belongs and who doesn't. We're saying, okay, if you're going to believe that way, if you're going to think those things, well, you don't belong in my group. If you're going to, if you're going to, if you're going to pursue those things, if you're going to vote that way, if you're going to hold those policies, well, you don't belong in my group. Must I remind us, it's not our group. It is God's group. It is his kingdom. And he's saying, look, I don't make those judgments on people. That's not, what I'm, that's not what I'm leading with. What I care about is the person. What I care about is who they are. And we get like in this, this mindset, like this is how it has to be. Like we have to do that. We have to divide. There's no other way. Like we got, we got to keep everything. Like, you know, anyways, we just have to divide. But there is a better way forward. And we know there's a better way forward because for some of us who've been around long enough, we remember a past where people didn't divide over every issue. But we also know that there's a better way forward because we've seen it modeled through the practices of the early church. Again and again and again, the church excelled at bringing people who held nothing in common together under the banner and the umbrella of Jesus Christ. The church throughout its history, has modeled what we should strive for in our world today. Look at what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. He said these words in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. These are powerful words. But these are words when stripped from the cultural context of the day, lose a little bit of its meaning. Here's what we need to understand, first and foremost, that these words by Paul were an affront to the Roman Empire. I mean, th th these words, they amount to treason. What Paul is doing in here is he's calling into question the social order of the day. 
I mean, Rome, they were fine. You could do a lot of things, you could pursue a lot of things, but you were not allowed to call into question the social order of the day. And this is exactly what Paul's doing. And the reality is, even though this would have put him on, on dangerous ground with the empire, is that is the church is receiving these words. This is a struggle for them too. I mean, Paul says, look, look, in the kingdom of God, there's no Jew or Gentile. And when they were hearing these words, they're like, well, wait a second, Paul. Like, you don't understand. There are definitely two groups of people. People who fundamentally view the world through different lenses. Like the Jewish people would look at the Gentiles and think, well, they're just immoral people. They're just chasing after the things of this world. Where the Gentiles would look at the Jews and the Jews, they'd be like, all you care about is your religious laws. Like you have no understanding about how this culturally plays out in our world today. Like you're so focused on what God did that you're missing what God is doing in this moment. And this group of people, they'd go back and forth, back and forth. They would debate, they would argue, they would disagree. They would attribute what they see in the other as some sort of character flaw. And yet Paul is saying, look, in the church, there's not, there's not Jew nor Gentile. There's not something that's gonna divide us on this basis. And people would have heard this like, Paul, Paul, you can't just like smooth this over like it's not a thing. But Paul's not finished. Paul goes on. He goes, look, it's not Jew nor Gentile. It's also neither slave nor free. Now, there is a common belief in the ancient world that some people were born to be ruled over. Other people were born to be ruled. Some were born to be owned. Others were born to be Owners. Everyone in the ancient world believed this. Every pagan god believed this. Every pagan religion perpetuated this. And not only was this the prevailing belief in the ancient world, it was also the foundation of the economy. That, that's how people got rich. People acquired people. They sold people. Other people bought. It was the basis of the economic system of the day. And Paul is saying, look, in my God, with my God, there is no distinction between slave and free. That God elevates the slave to the same status. He gives the same dignity. He gives the same worth of the slave as he does to the free. And when people hear this, like, Paul, no. Like, you don't, like, it, okay, fine. Rome doesn't like it. Rome doesn't like it that you're going to mess with the whole, like, social structure of thing. But now you're talking about my pocketbook. Now you're talking about how I make money, how I feed my family, how I, how I take care of my world. Like, this is how I do what I'm able to do. Like, what do you mean, Paul? We can't do this anymore? We, we, we can't elevate certain people over other groups of people? And, and, and that would be enough, right? Like, Paul's already gone at this pretty hard. But he goes even further. He goes, look, it's not just Jew or Gentile. It's not just slave or free. There's neither a distinction between male and female. And when Paul, when these words of Paul are read to the church in Galatia, I promise you, this is what the, they would have heard. <gasps> there would have been a gasp in the crowd. Okay, Paul, we'll, we'll let you slide on the whole social structure thing. You know, we'll, we'll even move a, li a little bit when it comes to, to the economy here, Paul, but... But are you really trying to say that men aren't superior to women? Paul, are you really trying to say that we can't treat women like our property any longer? Are you saying that women deserve equal rights, equal opportunities, equal tre treatment? Paul, is that what you are saying? This is shocking. It's unheard of. I mean, Paul is saying, look, here are all the parts of society that struggle to be together. Jews, Gentiles don't like each other. Slave, frees don't get along. Male and female, don't, not, they often don't get along. Paul's saying all of them, all of them belong under the banner of Christ because we are one in Christ Jesus. That in the kingdom of God, we are one. That everyone, everyone belongs in this kingdom. People that the world divided found unity in the church. There's a better way forward. 
that we can look to the lessons of the early church and we can see that there's a better option than what the world sells us as the only option. It was the unity of the early church that disrupted culture. It was the unity of the church that shocked the world and eventually it was the church's message and its unity that would change the world. The church brought people together in ways that the world thought was impossible. And guys, this didn't happen by accident. Like it didn't just like everyone showed up someday in a place and was like, hey, we should all get along. It happened because the church fought for it. The church fought because they knew that division was a choice. They knew that inside these walls that they belonged no matter what, where they came from, outside these walls. And they fought that the people in the community of the church would be united together. They fought for what mattered and they knew it mattered because it's what Jesus prayed for. The night before Jesus was crucified, he spent some time with the Father in prayer. He could have prayed about anything. I mean, he could have chosen to pray about anything, but this is what Jesus prayed for in that moment. John 17 and verse 11. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. I mean, Jesus prays for our unity. He prays that the church would stand together. He prays that we would be one. But he also prays for those who are not yet a part of the church. He prays for those who are not yet part of the community. He prays for all of us who call Jesus our Lord. But listen to what else he prays. He says this beginning in verse 20. He says, look, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as uh, you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete Unity. Then the world, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. One of the most important things for Jesus was the unity of his people. Now we like to talk a lot about the, the things that Jesus said. And, and one of the things that Jesus says, said that we often talk about is that Jesus' followers would be known by their love. They're known by their love, the way that they love people, the countercultural ways that they care and love for other people. The followers of Jesus will be known by their love. But what Jesus is also saying here is he's praying. He's like, I would also pray, God, that it's not just their love that they would be known by, but they would be known by their unity. That the way that they love the world and the way that they can stand together, even though they disagree, that that would be a testament to the world of what I'm really about. Now, I think we all know this. There's a difference between unity and uniformity. What unity is, is unity says, look, we are a group of people that share one purpose, one focus, that we are chasing after one thing. We are pursuing what matters most. And in the context of what we're talking about, it's the kingdom of God. That unity within the church is like, we're going to keep the main thing, the main thing. We as people are ambassadors of Christ, chasing after the kingdom of God, bringing the kingdom of God into our world to make it more present and more evident through everyone we interact with. That's what unity in the church looks like. But uniformity, uniformity is different. What uniformity says, look, is all people need to sort of believe the same thing, act the same way. When it comes to uniformity, there's really no allotment for differences. And you don't need to look any further than the early church to know uniformity was never the goal. Jew, Gentile, slave free, male, female. No way, no way you're going to get all of those people to agree on anything probably outside the lordship of Jesus Christ. 
Uniformity wasn't the goal. Unity was the goal. Unity is what Jesus prayed for. And that became the focus. That as they pursued God, they would also make the commitment to pursue each other. That they would fight to stay together because they knew it's what Jesus desired. They knew that the unity of the church would be one of the greatest testimonies to the world. That it would be the unity of God's church that would set it apart from every other entity in the world. And since the very beginning of the church, baptism has always been a declaration of its unity. That through the act of baptism, when someone makes the decision to be baptized, they step into the waters. There's nothing special about the waters, but as they step into the waters, they're lowered into the water. They're symbolically dying to themselves. They're dying to their old way of living. As they die to themselves, they are uniting themselves with Christ as they are raised up out of the water to step out and to walk a new life in Christ. Through baptism, we unite ourselves with Jesus. It's this beautiful picture of unity. But baptism is about more than just uniting ourselves with Jesus. Through baptism, we unite ourselves to one another. I mean, let's just look at what Paul says. Paul says these words in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says, For we were all baptized. We were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body. And then here, here Paul goes again. Whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. We all form one body whether you're slave or free. That when we step into the waters of baptism, we are not just uniting ourselves with Jesus, but we're unifying ourselves with the body of Christ. And Paul talks a lot about the ways that we all are unique, we all have our own gifts, yet collectively, together, we bring forth God's kingdom, his values, his teachings, his principles, not just through the way that we live our lives, but our commitment to being united to one another. Unity for the church, I believe, is mission critical. The world is going to tell us that it's impossible. The world's going to tell us that everyone needs to be uniform. But history tells us that there's a better way forward. And so we're just weeks away from an election cycle. So let me just say this. By all means, disagree politically. Disagree. Debate. Go back and forth. But love unconditionally. That when the conversation is over, pick up your plate from the table Walk into the kitchen, get to work, knowing that what it is that unites us together is far greater than anything that is trying to divide us. And that is our unity, the unity that we have with Jesus and the unity that we share with one another. It's that unity, just like it did in the past, that will shock culture. It is our unity that with the message of Jesus can change the world just like it did before. This weekend, as we wrapped up this series, very intentionally, we chose to have an opportunity as a church to celebrate baptisms together. And so in just a second, just a couple people are going to come forward to get baptized. We had four or five baptisms, first service. We had one on Wednesday night that we're just going to watch in a second. These are people who are declaring through their life that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. They're declaring what they're for trumps what they can be against. That God is for us. He's before us. And our calling is to pursue after him, his teachings, in his way, each and every day. Would you do me a favor and check out the screen behind me as you watch this baptism from Wednesday night.
So Chase, I'm going to ask you three questions. After I ask you those three questions, you can cross your arms and you can plug your nose so you don't get anything up your nose. And your dad is going to baptize you. Okay. Chase, do you believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Yes. Awesome. And are you kind of confessing and admitting tonight that you need Jesus, that you need the, his salvation that he offers? Definitely. And last question is, are you committing to following him for the rest of your days? Absolutely. Awesome. Chase, based on uh, your confession of faith, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Woo! All right, we have two today. Obviously, the ones that are wearing Lakeshore shirts. You can keep those, by the way. So why don't you come up? Why don't you tell everybody your name? Ella. Ella, pleasure to meet you. Why don't you step up on in here? All right. Ella, do you give your life to Jesus forever and always, and do you declare him as your Lord and Savior? All right. Jen's now going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, all right. And this is Tavlin, right? Pleasure to meet you, Tavlin. Here you go. Apparently your mom's here. So you jump on in and... Did he ask you to do this? Whoa, nice. I mean, I'm not offended. It's all gay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hey, disagreements are inevitable, but division's a choice. I'm going to baptize you uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But first, do you give your life to Jesus? Do you declare him your Lord and Savior? All right. Mike's now going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, you're welcome. How about another round of applause for these two that just gave their life to Jesus? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> hey, the water is still warm. Yes, the water is still warm, and if you feel this tug in your spirit that maybe today is the day that you give your life to Jesus, I just want to encourage you that uh, I'm going to stay up here, and if you're feeling like today is the day to come on up, I'd love to talk to you. We have all the things that you need, uh, t-shirts, which actually is a free gift to you uh, from us, also some shorts if you need them. So we have all the logistical things covered. The only thing that you have to do is just step forward and say, I declare that Jesus is Lord. Okay, so let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll, sit, we'll go about our day. God, thank you so much for all that you've done today in the service, that the life change that has happened has been truly wonderful and amazing to see and witness. God, eternal decisions were made today, and we are thankful that we get to be a part of these stories. So we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day, wonderful week. We'll see you next week.